This would be for Nabil. Can you explain with logic and a rational way the concept of the Trinity? Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Next question. Um, no, that's a very good question um, because it is uh, so idiosyncratic to the Christian faith and it is extremely important to understand. Um, when I first wrestled with the Trinity, I found it to be very difficult. In fact, I was taught that the Trinity was veiled polytheism. Uh, being raised in a Muslim home, uh, especially with verses from the Quran like Surah Al-Maidah, verse 73. Uh, it made it pretty clear to me that the Trinity is a belief in three. Three gods, not one. And when you, I asked the average Christian to explain what the Trinity was, I usually didn't get anything more than a blank stare. Um, and they would say, well, it's three in one. And I'd say, well, what does that mean? You know, it's three in one. It's like, well, that's a shampoo, not God. Tell me, what, what, is, what, what do you mean three in one? And generally speaking, I wouldn't get a response. I'm going to cut to it so that we can have more questions. It, it's important to be able to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity if you believe in it. Uh, if you believe in it, be able to articulate it. Otherwise, you don't really know what you believe in and you don't actually believe it. You want to believe it, but you don't know what it is. So be able to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is the belief that God is one in being and three in person. One in being and three in person. So right off the bat, it's not a contradiction. Because if I were to say it's one in being and three in being, that is a contradiction. It's one in being and three in person. So what's the difference between a being and a person? A being is that quality or that essence or that substance, whatever you want to call it. A being is that which makes you what you are. And a person is that quality or that essence that makes you whom you are. So be, a being is that which makes you what you are. A person is that which makes you whom you are. Now, what kind of a being am I? Thanks for the vote of confidence. I appreciate, appreciate that. Human being. I'm a human being. Just so you know. Now, who am I? I am Nabil Qureshi. So, what I am is a human being. That's my being. Who I am is Nabil. That's my person. The two are not the same thing. All of us in here shame, share essentially the same type of being that we are. We are human beings, but none of you share essentially the same kind of person that I am. We're all different persons. So the characteristic of a being is very different from that of a person. God, is, so I, I am one being with one person. God is one being with three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Is there anything like that on this earth? No. But does that mean God cannot be one being in three persons? Absolutely. It means he can, he can be that if that's what he is. There's no way we can know these deeper things about God apart from revelation. Uh, I do think that there is enough evidence in this world for us to conclude that God exists. I think it is the most rational conclusion. It's the most, uh, it covers the most data. It makes the most sense. It fulfills, I think, the criterion of Occam's razor. I think it works. Uh, but how much can we know about God after that point? I think revelation is necessary to know the deeper things about God. And this is one of them, that God is three in one. Uh, it tied in with this concept then of Trinity is also the idea of the persons of God. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Son of God? What does it mean for, G uh, for God the Father to be the Father? These are different roles in the Trinity. And oftentimes people see the term Son and then impute inferiority to the Son. Uh, in a sense, that's accurate to do. So let me put together some Bible verses for you, because especially when I debate Muslims or dialogue with them, these issues come to the fore, as they did with me when I was a Muslim. Some people will say that Jesus says things like in the Gospel of John, he says, the Father is greater than I. How is it possible that Jesus is God when he says, the Father is greater than I? And I would answer that question by saying, in, in our organization, Uncle Ravi Zacharias, he is the CEO of the organization. He is greater than I am. I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. He's at the top. And right now I'm earning brownie points. So he is greater than I am, but he is a human just as I am. So his being 
is essentially equal to mine. He's a human being. I'm a human being. We're equal in that sense. But his role is greater than mine. And I'm inferior in that sense. So when Jesus says the father is greater than I, the being is equal. The role is different. And this is how the Trinity all comes into focus when we start reading the scripture. One last thing I want to close with is some people will say to me, but Nabil, the Trinity is not present in the Old Testament. This is something new that Christians came up with. I don't think so. I think when you start reading the Old Testament a bit more carefully, now through the lens of clarity that we have from the New Testament, you start seeing it in the Old Testament. And people might say, where? Where did we start seeing the Trinity in the Old Testament? I see it in the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, let's take that back into the Hebrew. It says, Elohim created. Elohim is the plural of God. It's gods. In the beginning, gods. But then the word created treats that word as if it's singular. In the beginning, God's created as if it were singular. So right there at the very beginning of the Old Testament, you have plurality and singularity in the Godhead. You see it again in the very same chapter where it says, we, God refers to himself as we, plurally. How can God refer to himself plurally? And some people say, well, you know, the Queen of England does that. (laughs) The plural of majesty was not used in Hebrew at that time. It was not convention. And then also when God says, we will create man in our image, male and female, we will make man. Male and female, in his image, and then it goes to plurality once again. Multiple times, plurality in the Godhead. I'll end by saying this, in the Shema, this this is the statement that Jews would often recite twice a day. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. A very profound proclamation. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. In a world of polytheism, it's very profound. But that word one, echad, is not used to describe a singularity. It's used to describe something like a cluster of grapes. You would refer to the entire cluster as one cluster. That's what the word echad is. So even in the Shema, we have shades of the Trinity. It's just clarified through the person of Jesus, and it explains so much of what happens in the Gospel. And I think, uh, there's a lot more we could discuss here, but I think it's one of the most beautiful teachings about the depth of God's character and how he is unlike anything in this universe.